The man known to history as Osama bin Laden was born on the 10th of March 1957. His birthplace is a matter of dispute, with international police organizations believing for years that he was born in the city of Jeddah in Western Arabia, but it is now generally accepted that he was born in the Saudi capital Riyadh. His father was Mohammed bin Awad bin Laden, who was born in Yemen in 1908. When he was a child, his family had emigrated from Yemen, north to the red coast of Western Arabia, in a region which now forms part of Saudi Arabia, but which was, at the time, disputed between the Ottoman Empire and the royal house of Saud. In the 1930s, he had emerged as a successful construction contractor, working for the first ruler of Saudi Arabia, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud. Under the patronage of the royal family, the company he founded, the Saudi Bin Laden Group, emerged as an enormously successful and wealthy construction company in the fledgling nation, even as it became the world's largest oil exporter and an extremely wealthy nation for successful families such as the Bin Ladens. Usama's mother was Hamida al-Attas, a native Syrian who came from a family of successful citrus farmers operating around the port city of Latakia. She became Mohammed's tenth wife in 1956 when she married the 48-year-old millionaire when she was just 14 years of age. A year later, Osama was born. He was their only child and Mohammed and Hamida separated soon afterwards. This has caused speculation that they never actually married and Hamida was just briefly Mohammed's concubine. Osama's youth and upbringing was one of privilege. By the time he was born, his father was a multimillionaire, though his wealth would have stretched into the billions if adjusted for inflation today. Shortly after his parents' divorce, Osama's mother remarried to a business associate of Mohammed bin Laden's, Mohammed al-Attas. They had four children together in the 1960s, three boys and one girl. Osama was sent to live with them and so he grew up in his mother's and stepfather's household with several step-siblings. But it would be wrong to suggest that he was estranged from his father. Mohammed bin Laden played a major role in his son's development, instilling in him much of his conservative religious fervor. Beginning in 1968, Osama attended the al Taga Model School, a secondary school in Jeddah. In 1971, he gained direct experience of the Western world when he was sent to Oxford University in Britain to undertake an English language course. Beyond this, he is believed to have displayed some traits typical of young boys during his childhood and early teenage years, being a football fan who followed Arsenal Football Club and showed an interest in military history. For all that, Osama's younger years had an air of normality to it, whereas there is no doubting that his background was anything but normal. By the 1960s, the Saudi Bin Laden Group was one of the most significant corporations in the entire Arab world. Its ties to the Saudi royal family were extremely extensive, and the company had even been granted the contracts to manage the ongoing repairs of the mosques in the two most holy cities in the Islamic world, Mecca and Medina. In 1964, the company acquired the contract to reclad the exterior of the Dome of the Rock, the most important Muslim religious site in Jerusalem. By that time, the ties between Mohammed bin Laden and the Saudi royal family had become extremely extensive. However, in 1967, Mohammed was killed at 59 years of age in an airplane accident in Saudi Arabia when the pilot misjudged the plane's landing. Despite this setback, the Saudi bin Laden group continued to prosper under the leadership of several of Muhammad's sons from his earlier marriages and indeed, as it diversified in the 1970s and 1980s, it became a multi-billion dollar company with lucrative contracts all over the Middle East. Osama was not involved in the Saudi bin Laden group's business activities in the years after his father's death for the simple reason that he was too young. Instead, he was continuing his education. When he was 19 years of age, in 1976, Osama entered the King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah, where he began studying economics and business administration, no doubt with a view to taking up some sort of position within the family business in years to come. 
Already, however, he had begun to stray from an interest in business, with reports by people who knew Bin Laden there, stating that his primary interests were in religion, poetry, and Arab literature. He certainly didn't need to worry about money, his education, and future work, as Osama stood to inherit upwards of $30 million from his father's estate. He was also married by this time, having wed his first wife, a Syrian woman named Najwa Hanim, in 1974 when he was just 17 years old. She was also his first cousin on his mother's side, and the first of at least five wives. Osama would father over two dozen children during his life. Clearly, the mid to late 1970s were a formative period in Osama's life and his ideological views, though much of the evidence concerning these years is frustratingly patchy and sometimes contradictory. Nevertheless, the broad thrust of his views is clear. Osama began to develop a pan-Islamist ideology from early on in his life, a movement which espouses the idea that Muslims in all nations should be unified in defense and promotion of their faith. This view harks back to the age of the Arab Caliphate, which, between the 8th and 11th centuries, ruled most of the Middle East, North Africa, and adjoining regions from the Caliphate's capital of Baghdad. Central to pan-Islamism in the 1960s and 1970s was a commitment to reducing, and if possible, ending Western involvement in the Middle East, a region which had been dominated by the British and French since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire at the end of the First World War and wherein the United States was becoming an increasingly interested party even as British and French influence declined. The Middle Eastern world, which Osama grew up in, was also one in which the new state of Israel, backed strongly by the United States, was frequently at war with its Muslim neighbors, notably the Six-Day War of 1967 and the War of Yom Kippur in 1973. A particularly strong influence on Osama in the 1970s were the writings of Saeed Qutbah, an Egyptian Islamic scholar and religious and political theorist who had been a member of the Muslim Brotherhood until his arrest and execution in 1966. Qutbah's extensive writings were widely taught in schools and universities across the Muslim world from the 1940s onwards and included arguments that Islamic Jihad, or struggle against evil, was entirely justifiable in the interests of a new Islamic caliphate and that Sharia law, the law based on a rigid interpretation of the Qur'an, should be imposed across all Muslim states. A strain of virulent anti-Western sentiment also ran through much of Qutbah's writings, with him denouncing the United States as materialistic, godless, and lacking in spiritual values of any kind. If there was one defining influence on Bin Laden's ideological beliefs in the 1960s and 1970s, it was Qutbah. Significantly, Qutbah's brother Muhammad, who became a passionate promoter of his brother's ideas, was a teacher at Abdulaziz University in Jeddah, while Osama was a student there in the late 1970s. Osama finished his studies at Abdulaziz in 1979. It is unclear if he finished with a degree or not. The timing was significant as the Islamic world was in turmoil at this moment. Firstly, the Iranian Revolution of 1978 had seen the Western-backed Shah removed from power in Iran and the creation of a new Islamic state headed by the Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. While this was occurring in Iran, to the northeast in Afghanistan, the country was descending into political chaos. In 1978, the Marxist People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, or PDPA, had seized power and begun to establish a socialist, non-religious state. The PDPA had long-standing ties with the Soviet Union, and indeed Russia had always had an interest in Afghanistan, dating back to the mid-19th century, when the country had been an important buffer state between Russia and the British presence in India and Pakistan. Yet there is no major evidence that the Soviets were the driving force behind the PDPA's seizure of power in Afghanistan in 1978. However, they did forge close ties with the new Marxist regime in Kabul once it was in control of the country. 
Thus, once Islamist groups and other opponents of the PDPA began revolts against the new government in the course of 1978 and 1979, the Marxist regime soon called on Moscow for help. Limited support was sent at first, but as the situation for the PDPA continued to deteriorate, the Soviet Union effectively invaded Afghanistan in the final days of December 1979. By early 1980, thousands of Soviet tanks and tens of thousands of soldiers had been deployed as Moscow occupied the main cities of the country. Even before the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, Bin Laden had traveled to Pakistan very quickly after finishing his studies at King Abdulaziz University. Pakistan played and continues to play a significant role in international jihadist movements of the 20th and early 21st century. Ostensibly, the country has claimed to be opposed to Islamic fundamentalism operating on its soil, but for decades it has turned a blind eye to this in actuality, in large part because Muslim Pakistan has been involved in a long-running cold war with its bitter enemy Hindu India since the British Raj was split up along religious lines in 1947. Pakistan would play a role in Bin Laden's life over the next three decades. Once he arrived there in 1979, he quickly came under the wing of Abdullah Azam, a Palestinian-born jihadist who was an influence on many of the most senior Islamic terrorists of the late 20th century. Azam encouraged Bin Laden shortly afterwards to join the tens of thousands of Muslim men who were heading to Afghanistan to fight against the atheistic Soviet invaders. These individuals became known as Mujahideen, a term which translates roughly as one who engages in holy war or jihad. In the early 1980s, Bin Laden began using his inherited fortune to recruit and train Mujahideen in Pakistan before they headed into the mountainous regions of Afghanistan, though this financing paled in comparison with the billions of dollars spent by the United States and the Saudi Arabian governments in equipping and training anti-Soviet forces in both Afghanistan and Pakistan, which were used as their proxies to fight the Soviet invasion. Moreover, while statements about the extent to which Bin Laden was financed and trained himself by American agents at this time have been exaggerated, there is no doubt that he did have some limited contacts with US special forces in the region in the 1980s. The war which Bin Laden became involved in from 1980 onwards developed much like conflicts in Afghanistan have for the last two centuries, with 80,000 troops committed by the Soviets by the end of 1980 and far superior weaponry, they were able to occupy and hold the main cities and prop up the Marxist PDPA. But the Mujahideen groups, of which there were more moderate and fundamentalist branches, were largely in control of the regions outside of the city. The Hindu Kush mountains, which dominate much of the country, particularly in the east and north, are ideal territory for the waging of guerrilla warfare and this is exactly the shape the Soviet-Afghan war took on in the 1980s. The fighting became extremely bloody as the Soviets used indiscriminate bombing and destruction of rural villages to try to root out the insurgents. By the mid-1980s, upwards of 4 million people out of Afghanistan's population of 14 million had been displaced, with hundreds of thousands becoming refugees in Pakistan and Iran. While the conflict resulted in at least half a million deaths, and perhaps as many as three times this amount. It soon became known as the Soviet equivalent of what the Vietnam War had been for America, as the Russians faced an enemy which they could not defeat. Throughout this period, Bin Laden was a major figure in the Mujahideen movement in Afghanistan. At first, he had begun supplying goods to the fighters in the country and also facilitating the movement of individuals who wanted to take up arms against the Soviets from his native Saudi Arabia to Pakistan, where they were trained and equipped before they were sent north. Throughout these years, Bin Laden moved between Pakistan and the Mujahideen strongholds in the mountains of the Hindu Kush. In 1984, he and his mentor Abdullah Azam established Maktab al-Khidamat, an organization which aimed to raise funds from both within the Arab world and the Western world to continue fighting the war against the Soviets, 
This funding was then used to purchase weapons and train Mujahideen. By 1986, the network had trained hundreds of fighters who were based in eastern Afghanistan at Bin Laden's base known as Al Masada, the Lion's Den. These led the Mujahideen action against the Soviets and the Marxist regime at the Battle of Jaji in the late spring and early summer of 1987. The battle was ultimately of little strategic significance in the wider war, but it gained Bin Laden a significant reputation amongst the Mujahideen and within the wider Arab world, in part owing to the reports on the battle produced by an emerging Saudi journalist by the name of Jamal Khashoggi, with whom Bin Laden was associated but who held very different political religious views to him. The establishment of Maktab al-Khidamat was significant in the 1980s as it laid the groundwork for the jihadist movement with which Bin Laden has become synonymous. As the war in Afghanistan headed towards inexorable defeat for the Soviets and the Marxist regime, which they propped up in the late 1980s, thoughts turned to the future of the organization. Some members wanted it to remain a moderate entity which continued the initiative against the Soviets. But Bin Laden, Abdullah Azam and others were opposed to this and believed that Maktab al-Khidamat should be transformed into a larger organization which would seek to continue the expulsion of non-Arab powers from the Arab and Muslim world. Ultimately, this more extremist wing of the movement resulted in Bin Laden and Azam establishing a new organization in 1988 known as Al-Qaeda, meaning the base or the foundation. In time, it would become the largest jihadist organization in the world and is notorious around the world as such today. Al-Qaeda's goal from its inception was to begin waging holy war or jihad against non-Muslims anywhere in the traditional Muslim world, that is, the Middle East, Lower Central Asia, the Maghreb in North Africa, and also more peripheral parts of the Muslim world such as Somalia, Mali and Nigeria, Sub-Saharan Africa and Muslim regions further to the east in Indonesia and elsewhere. Much of its ideological framework centered on removing American influence from the Middle East and also destroying the State of Israel, which it perceived as a Western enclave in the Levant. Over time, the group began to believe it needed to incite a major war against the United States in order to radicalize the Muslim world against the kafir, or non-Muslims. Because the organizations could not hope to engage in outright conflict early on, its modus operandi during its early years would be terrorist tactics. Additionally, Al-Qaeda viewed moderate Muslims as having wavered from traditional Islam and it wished to establish a rigid form of Islamic rule across the Muslim world, one based on Sharia law and a literal interpretation of the Quran. By the time Al-Qaeda was established in 1988, the war in Afghanistan was winding down already. Upon becoming leader of the Soviet Union in 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev publicly stated that it was his intention to bring Soviet involvement in the country to an end. But much like it took America years to fully extricate itself from Vietnam, the Soviets could not pull out overnight. Indeed, in the short term, there was a significant increase in the number of Soviet troops on the ground in Afghanistan as Moscow attempted to win the war quickly through a troop surge. This did not meet with success, as Ronald Reagan's administration continued to send significant amounts of military and financial aid to the Mujahideen. Indeed, once they were equipped with Stinger missiles to shoot down Soviet helicopters, the Mujahideen guerrilla war entered a period of unprecedented success for the insurgents. Eventually, peace accords were signed by the Afghan government the Soviet Union, the US and Pakistan in 1988 and in 1989 the last Soviet troops were withdrawn. In the years that followed, the Marxist regime began to lose ever greater amounts of ground to the Mujahideen groups and eventually collapsed in 1992. But no sooner was the communist regime out of the way than the various Mujahideen groups turned on each other. Four years of civil war would follow before one group known as the Taliban emerged victorious in 1996, 
though they would never acquire complete control of the country, and indeed much of the North was held into the late 1990s and early 2000s by the Northern Alliance. In the aftermath of the Soviet-Afghan War, Bin Laden initially returned to his native Saudi Arabia in 1989. He received a hero's welcome for his role in having helped to oust the Russians from Afghanistan. Back in the Arabian Peninsula, he began working with the Saudi Bin Laden Group, his father's business, in an effort to leverage its economic might and business ties to help grow Al-Qaeda. In tandem, he began meeting with other leading members of the Islamic Jihadist movement in Egypt and elsewhere. During this time, relations between Bin Laden and the Saudi government began to deteriorate. Bin Laden was bent on developing an ever more confrontational path against non-Muslims, while the Saudi government continued to foster its position as a key American ally in the Middle East. A point of conflict which arose between Bin Laden and the Saudi regime was over the South Yemen civil war. Bin Laden wished for Saudi Arabia to intervene directly to oust the Soviet-backed Yemeni Socialist Party, but the royal government in Riyadh blocked his efforts to do so. Another issue involving another neighbor of Saudi Arabia was soon to cause friction between Bin Laden and the Saudi government in ways which would ultimately sever relations between him and the Saudi royal family. On the 2nd of August 1990, Saddam Hussein, the dictator of Iraq, who had spent much of the 1980s fighting a war against Iran, in which he was heavily supported by the United States, invaded the small Gulf state of Kuwait, one of the richest nations per capita on earth and one which Iraq owed billions of dollars to, which it had borrowed to finance its war against Iran in the 1980s. The invasion, which saw the small city-state conquered within two days, caused international uproar and, within weeks, the United States was building a coalition of military allies to launch a counter-invasion of Iraq, one which included Britain, France, Germany and dozens of other countries. It was also supported by several Arab and Muslim countries, notably Egypt, Syria and Saudi Arabia. By the autumn of 1990, as negotiations to find a peaceful settlement were still underway, American troops began traveling to the Middle East for a military buildup. They headed primarily for Saudi Arabia, which was to be used as the staging post for the liberation of Kuwait and the attack on Iraq if negotiations failed. That is exactly what happened, and so what was termed Operation Desert Storm by the US military was initiated on the 16th of January 1991. Bin Laden was outraged from the very beginning of the military buildup as the Saudi government agreed to a proposal by the US Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney that America should intervene to prevent any extension of Iraq's aggression into Saudi Arabia. In response to this, Bin Laden organized a meeting with the Saudi ruler King Fahd and requested that the country should prohibit American troops from assembling in Saudi Arabia and that he would use his own Arab legion formed in Afghanistan during the war to defend the Saudi border against any Iraqi incursion. This offer was spurned and the US and coalition troop buildup intensified in the weeks that followed. As it did, Bin Laden began publicly denouncing the Saudi government, engaging in a hostile propaganda campaign in which he stated that the royal family was inviting Western infidels into the kingdom which was the defender of the holiest sites in Islam, Mecca and Medina. He also attempted to convince the ulama, the senior Saudi religious scholars, to issue a fatwa, or religious declaration, condemning the American incursion into the Arabian Peninsula. All of this combined to cause a fatal breach between bin Laden and the Saudi government, and in 1991, they expelled him from the country. Meanwhile, Operation Desert Storm had resulted in the swift defeat of Iraq and the liberation of Kuwait in the spring of 1991. Rather than try to pursue regime change, the US left Saddam Hussein in charge, pulled its troops out of the region, and imposed crippling sanctions on Iraq. Following his expulsion from Saudi Arabia in 1991, bin Laden headed for Sudan, settling there in 1992. 
In 1989, Colonel Omar al-Bashir had seized power in a largely bloodless military coup. He quickly implemented a form of Sharia law across Sudan, making the country a suitable haven for bin Laden to continue his activities from. The Saudi Mujahideen was invited to Sudan personally by Hassan al-Turabi, the speaker of the Sudanese National Assembly and the second most powerful figure within Sudan next to al-Bashir. Here, bin Laden was soon established in his own well-defended compound, with his followers within al-Qaeda defending the site with advanced weaponry. New training bases for Mujahideen were established near the capital of Khartoum, and bin Laden had a manor in the city. As a result of the free reign he was given in Sudan, the country was designated as a state sponsor of international terrorism, as in the aftermath of the Gulf War. Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda had come under increasing observation by the American Intelligence Service and the State Department. Thus, while Bin Laden remained in Sudan from 1992 to 1996, the US was monitoring his activities on an almost daily basis with flyovers of his compound and other intelligence gathering. By 1996, US sanctions against Sudan over its harboring of Bin Laden and many other prominent Islamic fundamentalists and terrorists had begun to damage considerably the country's economy. Moreover, the president Omar al-Bashir had outflanked bin Laden's primary supporter within the government, Hassan al-Turabi. Consequently, it was made clear to bin Laden by 1996 that Sudan was no longer a safe refuge. As a result of the expulsion, he headed that year back to Afghanistan where the Taliban had just cemented its control over much of the country. There, he became the personal guest of Mullah Muhammad Umar, the first leader of the Taliban government after seizing power. He quickly issued a declaration of war against the United States in August 1996 through various Islamic media channels, arguing that the US had occupied Saudi Arabia through its military bases since 1990 and that it was the principal supporter of Israel in the region. It has been speculated that bin Laden's actions in 1996 were owing to the loss of much of his wealth from his family background when he left Sudan, and that the expulsion order served to radicalize bin Laden further and set him on a path of all-out war with the government of the United States, the sanctions of which against Sudan had pressured the Sudanese government into the stance it took. From his return to Afghanistan in 1996 onwards, Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda were wholly committed to confrontational terrorist actions towards the United States in particular. These had always been a part of the organization's modus operandi. As early as 1990, the Federal Bureau of Investigation had raided the home of El Sayed Nazaire, an Al-Qaeda affiliate in New Jersey, where they had discovered documents concerning plans to blow up skyscrapers in New York City. In 1993, a truck bomb was detonated outside the North Tower of the World Trade Center in Manhattan. The leader of the attack was Ramzi Yusuf, another known affiliate of Al-Qaeda who had trained in one of their camps in Afghanistan in the late 1980s. In 1992, Bin Laden had financed and organized the bombing of the Gold Mihor Hotel in the city of Aden in Yemen. It is also widely believed that Al-Qaeda was involved in the Luxor massacre of November 1997 when 62 individuals, most of them Western tourists, were killed in the Egyptian city near the Valley of the Kings by six Islamic fundamentalist gunmen. Thus, by the second half of the 1990s, Al-Qaeda was stepping up its attacks on Western targets through terrorist methods. These attacks soon escalated even further. On the 7th of August 1998, simultaneous truck bombings occurred in the cities of Dar es Salaam, the capital of Tanzania, and the capital of Kenya, Nairobi. There was no doubt which nation the symbolic target of these attacks was, as the bombs were detonated outside the United States embassies in the two capital cities. These were complex terrorist attacks. For instance, the bombing in Nairobi involved 500 cylinders of TNT, while the Dar es Salaam bombing was undertaken with two 2,000-pound bombs. Ammonium nitrate fertilizer was used to pack and direct the blast so that it caused maximum damage to the embassies. Moreover, 
Both bombs were detonated almost simultaneously, resulting in the deaths of 213 people in Nairobi and 85 in Dar es Salaam, while thousands more were injured. There is no doubt also that bin Laden and Al-Qaeda were responsible and in the immediate aftermath of the bombings, bin Laden was placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted individuals list. It also brought Al-Qaeda to the attention of all intelligence services in the Western world, though unfortunately the risk which was posed by the terrorist organization was still not fully grasped. In the aftermath of the US Embassy's bombings, bin Laden continued to escalate his rhetoric against the United States. His grievances were multifarious, including US support for Israel and for a number of regimes who were persecuting Muslims within their borders, notably Russia's crackdown on Chechnya, the Philippine government's attacks on the Muslim Moro population of the Southern Islands, and India's oppression of Muslims in the Kashmir region in the north of the country. However, his foremost complaint was with the presence of American troops in the Arabian Peninsula and their proximity to the holiest places of Islam, Mecca and Medina. In 1998, Al-Qaeda stated that, quote, For seven years, the United States has been occupying the lands of Islam in the holiest of place. Thus, after the already sizable attacks on the US embassies, Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda turned their attention to an even more substantial attack this time on American soil. Remarkably, they decided to target the World Trade Center in New York City, which associates of Al-Qaeda had already tried to attack with a truck bomb back in 1993. The second attempt would be more devastating. Late in 1998 or early 1999, Bin Laden gave his approval to the World Trade Center initiative, which had first been proposed by an Al-Qaeda affiliate, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in 1996. The remainder of 1999 saw potential candidates to carry out the attacks being screened in Afghanistan. A prerequisite for the leaders were that they needed to be able to speak English and be familiar with living in Western society for a time. A number of individuals such as Mohammed Atta, Marwan al Sheikhi, and Ziad Jara were quickly selected. Another one, Hani Hanjur, was picked once it was realized that he had a commercial pilot's license and was a skilled airplane pilot. By 2000, 19 individuals had been selected and were being established in terrorist cells in the United States, operating in Arizona, Florida, and California. Final targets were selected in early 2001, with the intention being to hijack a number of commercial airline planes and fly them into buildings in suicide terrorist attacks. The Twin Towers, the two central buildings of the World Trade Center, were the primary targets, while the Pentagon in Virginia was also a target. It is also believed there were plans to fly a fourth plane into the US Capitol building, the seat of government in Washington, DC. With the plan in place and terrorist cells in position in the US to carry it out, a date was fixed for the simultaneous attacks. The day chosen was the 11th of September 2001. It is a popular belief that this date was chosen as September is the ninth month of the year and the date when written out using the American dating system comes out as 9-11, the same number used for emergency call services in the United States. However, it seems more likely that Bin Laden chose the 11th of September as it was the day in 1683 that John Sobieski III, the King of Poland, arrived at Vienna, the capital of Austria, which was under siege by the Turkish Ottoman Empire. The siege was broken by Sobieski, marking the conclusion of Ottoman expansion in southern Europe. Prior to it, the Christian world had been under pressure for centuries from Muslim expansion in the eastern Mediterranean and the Balkans, but after the siege of Vienna, the Christian Western powers began to encroach into the Muslim world. Bin Laden chose this symbolic date as a statement that these attacks on the United States by Al-Qaeda in 2001 would mark a new turning of the tide back in favor of Islam. On the morning of the 11th of September 2001, the 19 hijackers operating in independent cells began to implement their orders. Five hijackers boarded American Airlines Flight 11, 
which was scheduled to fly out of Logan International Airport in Boston at 7.59 a.m., bound for Los Angeles International Airport. Five others boarded United Airlines 175, which was making the same journey from Logan to Los Angeles. That plane took off from the runway in Boston 15 minutes after American Airlines Flight 11. Meanwhile, six minutes later, at 8.20 a.m., American Airlines Flight 77 took off from Washington Dulles International Airport in Virginia, not far from Washington, D.C. Five hijackers were also on board. Finally, 22 minutes after this, at 8.42 a.m., a fourth plane, United Airlines Flight 93, departed from Newark International Airport in New Jersey, bound for San Francisco. There were just four hijackers on this plane. What followed was a day of infamy. Within minutes of becoming airborne, the hijackers on all four planes were moving to take over the aircrafts. As a result, at 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center, traveling at a speed of approximately 750 kilometers per hour. While people all over Manhattan wondered if this could have been an accident, United Airlines Flight 175 was changing direction in the skies. At 9.03 a.m., 17 minutes after the first plane had hit the North Tower, it crashed into the South Tower at a speed of 800 kilometers per hour. Just over a half an hour later, American Airlines Flight 77 hit the west wall of the Pentagon in Virginia. Only United Airlines Flight 93 missed its target as it crashed into a field in Pennsylvania while the passengers were attempting to wrest control of it from the hijackers. The plane crashes were only the beginning of the carnage. When the planes struck the Twin Towers, well over 10,000 people were already inside beginning their day's work. With the elevators crippled by the damage from the initial impact and fires devastating the upper floors, the evacuation efforts could only proceed at a moderate pace as people had to head down dozens of staircases. The upper stories where the planes had hit were turned into an inferno, and within minutes, many of those who were still alive were jumping to their deaths. The South Tower, which had been hit second, collapsed at 9.59 a.m. It was followed 29 minutes later by the North Tower. In total, it is believed that 2,606 people lost their lives in the towers and on the ground, along with 147 passengers and crew on the two planes. The damage at the Pentagon was less severe, but even here, 125 died on the ground, along with 59 crew and passengers. The 40 crew and passengers on United Airlines Flight 93 all lost their lives. The September 11, 2001 attacks, accordingly, were the most devastating terrorist attacks in world history. Moreover, because media outlets had begun covering the story within minutes around the world and footage of the planes striking the towers was soon available, the psychological impact of the attacks was unparalleled as an act of terrorism. At first, Bin Laden denied having been involved in planning the 9-11 attacks on the United States. On the 16th of September, a statement was made by him, which was subsequently broadcast by Al Jazeera, in which he denied responsibility. However, in the months and years that followed, a growing amount of evidence was produced to substantiate an American intelligence services claim that he and Al-Qaeda had orchestrated the attacks. In 2004, Al Jazeera released a new video from him in which he unequivocally stated that he had been responsible for directing the 19 hijackers who boarded the four planes on the 11th of September 2001. This was supplemented by further admissions in 2006 and the surfacing of video footage in which Osama was seen conversing with some of the hijackers in the period leading up to the attacks. In the course of these, it was also stated by Bin Laden that his purpose in targeting the Twin Towers was to seek symbolic revenge for the destruction of numerous towers and multi-story buildings in Beirut in 1982 during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. At the time of the 9-11 attacks, Bin Laden was believed to be hiding in the White Mountains to the south of the Hindu Kush in Afghanistan, in the east of the country, near the border with Pakistan. 
The administration of the U.S. President George W. Bush moved quickly to pass a joint congressional resolution on the 18th of September 2001, authorizing the use of force against those who were deemed to be responsible for the 9-11 attacks. As the Taliban regime in Afghanistan had sheltered bin Laden and al-Qaeda since 1996 and refused to hand him over to American authorities, the regime as a whole was deemed to be a target. American and British aircraft consequently began bombing strategic targets in Afghanistan on the 7th of October 2001. Ties were established with the Northern Alliance, which held parts of the north of the country against the Taliban. In tandem, U.S. special operatives had been inserted into the country in small numbers as early as late September, but it was not until the 19th of October that the principal land invasion began as American troops, with allied contingents from dozens of other nations, began entering Afghanistan in large numbers. The war in Afghanistan resulted in a swift initial victory for the United States and its allies. By early November, American forces had encircled the capital, Kabul. An airstrike on the city on the 12th of November succeeded in killing one of bin Laden's closest allies, the number three figure within al-Qaeda, Mohammed Atef. The following day, Northern Alliance and US troops began entering the city as the Taliban either fled into the mountains or towards the southern city of Kandahar. It was in the latter city that the Taliban made their last major stand in late November. The remaining forces there surrendered in early December, ostensibly bringing the war to an end. It was also in early December that a new interim administration was established with Hamid Karzai as the first president of a new Afghanistan. However, this initial victory was effectively a false dawn, and Afghanistan would soon be riddled with insurgent revolts, which the US would never be able to defeat. The invasion of Afghanistan had also failed to bring bin Laden to justice. The US, though, had come tantalizingly close. Just as Kandahar was falling to the west, a group of several hundred Allied fighters, including 70 US Special Forces and dozens of other special operatives, along with a few hundred Northern Alliance fighters, conducted a campaign in the Tora Bora cave complex in the White Mountains, where bin Laden and many other Al-Qaeda members were believed to be hiding. A near two-week battle followed in the mountains and caves, a conflict which has become known as the Battle of Tora Bora. American intelligence services believe bin Laden was present during these clashes, but that he escaped as the Allied military presence was insufficient to apprehend him. He is believed to have made his way over the southern border into Pakistan in the days or weeks that followed. By now, bin Laden was the most wanted man in the world, with a bounty of $25 million on offer by the US government for information leading to his capture or death. That figure would be increased to $50 million in 2007 as the manhunt for the leader of Al-Qaeda and the architect of the 9-11 attacks continued. However, bin Laden and Al-Qaeda would pose a threat to America and the Western world for many years to come. Bin Laden's whereabouts in the years following his escape from Afghanistan in the winter of 2001 have been a matter of widespread speculation. By this time, he was the world's most wanted man and well-known all over the world. As such, his movements were secretive, and even the US intelligence services today can only patch together some of his whereabouts during the 2000s. Evidently, he, along with many other senior Al-Qaeda affiliates, spent the vast majority of these years in Pakistan. His presence here was not officially tolerated by the Pakistani government. Successive regimes in the capital Islamabad had been effectively supporters of Islamic terrorist organizations over the years, but in bin Laden's case, it was not possible for them to approve of his presence on Pakistani soil. Nevertheless, a light-touch approach to apprehending bin Laden, even when it was clear that he was in hiding in the country, was adopted, one which meant that the US intelligence services had to try to locate the terrorist leader within the country with lukewarm support from the Pakistani security services at best. For much of the time after his initial flight from Afghanistan, he is believed to have been in Waziristan, 
the mountainous region of northern Pakistan near the Afghan border. Reports in the second half of the 2000s sometimes placed him as having moved over the western border to Iran, but these were probably spurious and the reality is that bin Laden and al-Qaeda were able to live in Pakistan, largely unharassed, and in some comfort for years with the tacit support of powerful elements within Pakistan's politics and security services. During this time, bin Laden and al-Qaeda continued to organize terrorist activities throughout the wider Muslim world. Attacks on the United States became much more difficult in the aftermath of 9-11 as a massive security apparatus was put in place in American airports and other locations. However, there was no shortage of Western targets now in the Middle East. Firstly, Afghanistan had been occupied by American, British and other Allied troops in late 2001, and they would remain there in one form or another for the next 20 years. But the more intense Western presence was soon to be found in Iraq. Following the initial victory over the Taliban in Afghanistan, the administration of President George W. Bush in the US began making it clear that it intended to engage in further regime change in the Middle East, targeting states which it deemed to be supporters of terrorism. The regime of Saddam Hussein in Iraq, who had clung on to power following the Gulf War, was a noted priority. This policy would not meet with as much support from America's allies as the invasion of Afghanistan, with countries like France arguing that the Bush administration was now using the 9-11 attacks as a smokescreen for regime change in oil-producing countries and a form of US neo-imperialism in the region. Despite these reservations, the US and Britain, with several other smaller allied nations, invaded Iraq in March 2003, claiming that Hussein's regime was trying to obtain weapons of mass destruction and was a supporter of bin Laden's. Bin Laden had often cited the crippling economic sanctions which the US had imposed on Iraq following the Gulf War as one of his grievances against America, but there is no substantive evidence to show that the Hussein regime had ever materially supported bin Laden in any significant manner. The invasion proceeded much as it had in Afghanistan. A swift victory was won over the Ba'athist regime of Saddam Hussein, and within two months, President Bush announced US victory in the war. But it was not so simple. And as in Afghanistan, a vicious counterinsurgency campaign began in the summer of 2003 and lasted for years as many elements within Iraq tried to remove US forces from the country. Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda were involved in this internecine conflict. Their methods focused on trying to sow divisions between the Sunni Muslim minority and the Shiite Muslim majority in an effort to foment a civil war across Iraq. Traditional terrorist methods were employed such as the bombing of the Al-Askari Shrine in the city of Samara on the 22nd of February 2006. While this action did not result in widespread loss of human life, it did see the destruction of one of the holiest places in Iraq for Shiite Muslims and triggered days of sectarian violence in Baghdad and elsewhere in which at least a thousand people lost their lives. Eventually, by the late 2000s, the war in Iraq began to stabilize as a significant American troop surge in 2007, combined with political reforms, served to quell the worst of the violence. Nevertheless, Al-Qaeda continued their campaign, and from Pakistan, bin Laden sanctioned bombings in Baghdad and a suicide bombing on the Shiite Imam Hussein shrine in the city of Karbala in March 2008 which resulted in 42 deaths and the injuring of dozens of others. Meanwhile, back in Pakistan, bin Laden had moved into a new purpose-built compound in the city of Abbottabad in northern Pakistan. Construction on this had evidently begun shortly after bin Laden arrived in the country at the beginning of 2002, and it was completed in 2005. The compound was laid out on a 38,000 square foot estate and was surrounded by a concrete perimeter fence up to five and a half meters high and topped with barbed wire. There were few windows here and many screens to block vision of the interior, including a screen on a third floor balcony 
tall enough to ensure privacy there for Bin Laden, who was six foot four inches tall. It is hard to believe the authorities could have failed to recognize how unusual the new property was, and it was clearly built with security in mind. Bin Laden was probably living there from 2006 onwards with some of his wives, children and followers in a city not far from the Pakistan capital Islamabad. While Bin Laden's compound sheltered him in Pakistan for many years, eventually his over-reliance on it would be his undoing. In 2009, US intelligence services determined that Abu Ahmad al-Kuwaiti, a close confidant of Bin Laden's who is believed to have been with him at the Battle of Tora Bora in December 2001, when the terrorist leader narrowly avoided apprehension by the US, had begun to work as a trusted courier and messenger for Bin Laden while he was in hiding in Pakistan. In 2009, the CIA determined that al-Kuwaiti was living in Abbottabad. Further intelligence gathering led them to identify the Bin Laden compound as a peculiar building in the city. Tens of millions of dollars of funding were obtained from the US Congress to finance the establishment of a CIA team on the ground in Abbottabad, which in 2010 began monitoring the compound and those who entered and left it. Despite this extensive initiative and the use of the most sophisticated drone and surveillance devices available anywhere in the world, the team was never able to obtain a photograph or any other evidence which concretely established that Bin Laden was living within the compound. But by early 2011, the range of circumstantial evidence was such that they were convinced that this was the hideout of the architect of the 9-11 attacks. US President Barack Obama authorized what was codenamed Operation Neptune Spear on the 1st of May 2011. It was lunchtime in Washington, D.C. But only half an hour later, at nearly 11 p.m. at night in Afghanistan, Two Black Hawk helicopters carrying two dozen Navy SEALs took off from an American airbase in Afghanistan and flew over the border to Pakistan. Just over an hour and a half later, at what was half past midnight in Pakistan on the 2nd of May, the helicopters landed in the compound at Abbottabad. One of the helicopters crashed during the landing, but none of the Navy SEALs were injured. Fighting commenced as soon as they landed with a brief firefight with some of Bin Laden's followers. Then the Navy SEALs proceeded into the main compound. Back in Washington, D.C., President Obama and senior government and defense officials watched live footage of the raid from the Situation Room in the White House. On the second floor, the Navy SEALs encountered and shot one of Bin Laden's many adult sons, as well as another follower, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, whose presence in Abbottabad had first suggested to security services that Bin Laden might be sheltering in the city. Then, as they headed upstairs again, they found Bin Laden on the third floor. Their orders were to kill rather than apprehend the Al-Qaeda leader. There are conflicting accounts as to what then occurred, as different Navy SEALs have sought to claim credit for killing Bin Laden. But it seems most likely that it was Matt Bissonnette, who shot Bin Laden at 39 minutes past midnight local time, in the body and head, in the doorway of his bedroom. And he then staggered backwards into the room and fell to the floor, dead. Bin Laden was found to have 500 euros and two mobile phones sewn into his robes, no doubt for use if he found himself fleeing an attack on the compound, such as the one which led to his death. It was a rather pathetic demise. A decision had been taken in advance that Bin Laden's body would be disposed of quickly somewhere where his resting place would never be identified and turned into a shrine for Islamic fundamentalists and jihadists. Thus, shortly after he was killed and the compound was fully secured, the Navy SEALs placed the Al-Qaeda leader's corpse in a body bag and then brought it out to the helicopter that was still intact. After a sweep of the compound to gather any intelligence which might be useful for offsetting further terrorist attacks or establishing a more concrete idea of what Bin Laden had been doing over the years, the team exited the compound with the body on the sole functioning helicopter. A backup helicopter was called in to collect some of the remaining Navy SEALs. 
By 8 p.m. back in Washington, it had been confirmed that the body was that of bin Laden. President Obama addressed the nation a few hours later to announce news of the raid's success. As he was doing so, bin Laden's body was being taken out to some undisclosed location at sea and was disposed of there, weighted down with iron chains and rocks to ensure it sank to the sea floor. This was done within 24 hours of his death to comply with Islamic tradition. Sadly, the death of Osama bin Laden did not lead to any reduction in the threat which Islamic fundamentalists and jihadists posed to the Western world, or indeed to most Muslims in the Islamic world. As brutal as their tactics were, Al-Qaeda was already being eclipsed by more extreme jihadi movements by the time of bin Laden's death. In 2004, a Jordanian jihadist by the name of Abu Musab al-Zakawi had become an associate of Al-Qaeda in Iraq during the early stages of the counter-insurgency against the US occupation. In 2006, al-Zarqawi and several of his closest allies merged to form what they called the Islamic State of Iraq. In the years that followed, they went from strength to strength, but their methods also became ever more brutal, including the use of vicious tactics against Muslims who refused to live according to anything other than the most severe forms of Sharia law. By the time US forces were withdrawn from Iraq in the early 2010s, Al-Qaeda were increasingly unwilling to tolerate this approach to jihad in the Middle East, and a full split followed between the two organizations in the years following bin Laden's death under Al-Qaeda's new leader, Ayman al-Zahwari. Incredibly, by the 2010s, Al-Qaeda, the organization who carried out the 9-11 attacks, was being seen as too moderate by many Islamic fundamentalists, and the Islamic State of Iraq group were now garnering many more followers amongst would-be jihadists. In the years that followed, Islamic State of Iraq burst onto the consciousness of the entire world. Following the Arab Spring of 2011, a brutal civil war erupted in Syria, while the US departure from neighboring Iraq saw significant parts of the country fall out of the control of the government in Baghdad. In this environment, Islamic State under its new leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was able to begin taking direct control over a vast swathe of territory across northern Iraq and eastern Syria. In the course of 2014 and 2015, the newly named Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, or ISIL, came to international attention as they declared the establishment of an Islamic Caliphate over the lands they had taken control of. ISIL brought Islamic Jihad to a new level of brutality, which even Al-Qaeda distanced itself from. Gradually, control over eastern Syria and northern Iraq was wrested from ISIL between 2014 and 2017, as the US sent troops back into the region. As of the early 2020s, Islamic fundamentalism would seem to be on the decline, driven in part by rapidly improving living standards in the Middle East, a reduced inclination towards nation-building by the United States in the region, and a warming of relations between Israel and many of its Muslim neighbors. Indeed, the main threat of Islamic fundamentalism seems to have shifted from the Middle East to the Sahel, the region along the southern edge of the Sahara Desert where jihadi groups have undermined the stability of nations like Mali, Niger, Chad, and Burkina Faso. The Taliban has also returned to power in Afghanistan following the US withdrawal in 2021. Osama bin Laden was arguably the most significant figure in the history of modern Islamic fundamentalism. Beginning in the 1970s, he was gradually radicalized through his exposure to the ideas of Islamist scholars such as Saeed Qutb. This growing radicalism combined with the financial power available to him through the enormous bin Laden business empire in Saudi Arabia and the connections he enjoyed throughout Saudi society ensured that when the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan commenced in 1979, he was able to bring extensive powers to bear in training and equipping Mujahideen to fight the Russians throughout the 1980s. Had his career of opposition to non-Muslim incursions into the Islamic world ended there, he would simply be a footnote to history. But once the war against the Soviets wound down, 
he committed himself to a wider program of Islamic fundamentalism. His actions during the Gulf War highlighted his growing anti-Americanism and his willingness to split with Muslim regimes such as that of the Saudi royal family if they engaged in actions which he deemed antithetical to Islam. Thus, by the 1990s, a more extreme version of bin Laden and Al-Qaeda was emerging, as reflected in the increasingly brutal bombing campaigns being launched, the most severe being the US Embassy bombings of 1998, which killed hundreds and injured thousands. But it is ultimately the 9-11 attacks on the United States which bin Laden and Al-Qaeda have become most infamous for. On that fateful September morning in 2001, 19 hijackers acting on bin Laden's orders launched attacks which killed over 2,700 people in the space of a few hours, while thousands more had their lives cut short in the years that followed as a result of ancillary injuries. Just as damaging was the psychological impact. Most people have clear memories of where they were and what they were doing on the 11th of September 2001 as news of the attacks emerged and footage of the planes striking the Twin Towers surfaced on news outlets. Life changed in many ways that day, as additional security measures were imposed across the Western world to combat future attacks. Wars followed in the Middle East, and for years there was hardly a week went by when news of a major incident in Afghanistan, Iraq or somewhere was on the front pages of newspapers. All of this culminated in the rise of ISIL and a migrant crisis in the Mediterranean as millions of people sought to flee from Syria and Iraq. By that time, bin Laden was dead, killed in a rather ignominious end in a fortified compound he had been holed up in in Abbottabad for half a decade. But the world had been changed immeasurably by his violent extremism. What do you think of Osama bin Laden? Would it have been better for him to have been captured alive and placed on trial for his crimes? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.